Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior English A, and our objective here now this morning is to finish with our outlining of the epic poem Beowulf. Let's just summarize where we've been. We've talked about the Anglo-Saxons. We've talked about the Anglo-Saxon epic poem concept. And we've talked about the epic poem Beowulf. We pointed out that Beowulf is a poem of three parts. Each of these three parts are linked to the three monsters of Beowulf. You might make a note, by the way, to yourself to read in your packet in the critical analysis section when there is some suggestions that the three monsters of Beowulf represent three different kinds of evil. I would write this down and then maybe go back and take a look at it. After we finish with some annotative work, we may come back to have some converse about this topic. Beowulf 1, ostensibly, is the story of Beowulf fighting the great monster Grendel. Ultimately, Beowulf de will defeat that monster in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Beowulf 2 is the story of Beowulf fighting against Grendel's mother. Grendel, sometimes called Dam or Dane. Grendel's ma is upset that her boy came back, A, without his arm, and B, then, kind of kicked the bucket after that fact. In vengeance, she will kill one, only one, of King Hrothgar's greatest warriors. His name is Asher. We're told that Beowulf isn't there. Beowulf is summoned the next morning, we're told, and he comes tramping in and asks, how's it going? Hrothgar is not pleased and says, oh, terrible things. These are lines that we will study in some detail. Beowulf will give him a pep talk, will then go out and wearing full armor, including a really famous sword, Kohrenting. This is a famous fighting sword. They named their weapons in this time, we're told. And he barely defeats this old hag of a, of a woman, a uh, sea witch, but that's because she uses magic spells and the like. Ultimately, he defeats her. Ultimately, as well, he will take off the head of Grendel himself, and he will put that up as a famous trophy, Beowulf II will end with a famous speech. Now, I should pause here and point out that the Beowulf epic is a pretty boring epic if you look at the entire poem. What your textbook company does is it goes into the poem and it finds the most exciting parts where there's fighting. They extract those parts, and they publish those parts as the poem. What's interesting, and let's write it in our notes, is that the Anglo-Saxons went to the poem Beowulf for something far more than entertainment. Are you ready for this? It's the boring parts of Beowulf, namely the speeches, that mattered the most to the Anglo-Saxon people. We will look at a couple of these speeches in detail. One of the most famous of these speeches is the speech of Hrothgar at the end of Beowulf II, where the old king stands up in front of all of the assembly and says two things to Beowulf. One, you're a stud. No kind of warrior like you. Two, not for long. This becomes for us an understanding. This literary text becomes for us a what I will now call a propedeutic. That word means instructional. Didactic. In other words, it's not just that we're being entertained by a guy killing monsters, but we're rather being taught some really important truths that we will call Anglo-Saxon values. These are fundamental to the English development of the idea of core values, cultural core values. And uh, lest we forget, when uh, those uh, chaps arrived on Plymouth Rock, they were English, right? Our cultural heritage is English, which is why we spend some time talking about the uh, British literature, of which, of course, the Anglo-Saxons are kind of, in many ways, the, the first starters of all, of all of that. Beowulf III. Now we're ready to pick up with our notes from yesterday. Beowulf III is an add-on. We know that for many, many years, this oral story told around campfires and the like uh, was, uh, w w had, no, had no third part. Beowulf, uh, no death story for Beowulf. Beowulf had kind of just kind of gone off, you know, into the, uh, you know, into the never-never land of fantasy or whatever. However, in the third 
part of Beowulf, we're told two really important things. One, Beowulf is now an old fart. He's not young anymore like he was before. He has been king for 50 years, we're told, okay, back in the land of the Geats. We're no longer in the land of the Danes. Remember, that's where we started this poem. The second thing we're told is quite fascinating. We're told we're introduced right away to a new monster, not Grindel, not Grindel's mom, but a new monster called a dragon. Now, what's fascinating is if I got, right now, if I got all you on a bus, and we went over to one of the elementary schools and walked into any fifth grade classroom, and I walked in front of them and introduced myself, and then I said, today we're going to do an art project, we're going to draw, we're going to draw dragons. What's interesting is I wouldn't have to say much more than that. Those kids would take out their little uh, paints, and they would all start painting about the same kind of creature. He would look kind of like uh, a lizard, snake, scales, probably what color? Green. He would have a tongue like a serpent. He would have wings that would allow him to fly. And most impressively, the way he would destroy things is through fire from his mouth. Now what's fascinating is that if you go to any zoo in the world and you go from exhibit to exhibit asking what animal seems to resemble this kind of animal you're going to be hard pressed by the way for those of you that will say something like you know that uh, those um, uh, uh, dragons they're called in Indonesia that are those those kimonos uh, well you know I will tell you from first hand experience having spent a year or two of my young life in Indonesia and having seen these critters face to face, yeah, they ain't got no wings and they don't shoot no fire out their mouths. They will jack you as look at you, that I will tell you, but they are not dragons in any way like we think of this dragon. It's a fair question to ask, where do we get an idea like this of a dragon cre creature that flies through the air, oh, I'm not done. If, if I had sophisticated fifth graders, they would picture this dragon, strangely, as living in his lair, laying on top of bunches of gold treasure. Gold treasure. Uh, and, and then they go to sleep. For like a thousand years go to sleep. And then when they wake up, they immediately know if any of the treasure's missing. Now what are dragons going to do with treasure? I, what, go to Walmart and buy new CDs? I don't know. But um, this, is, this is also a part of dragon lore. Uh, and these dragons, for some reason, get really upset if you mess with their treasure. And then they go out and start jacking lots of humans. Now, where would we get an idea like that? Well, obviously, I wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't from Beowulf 3. So let's go ahead and put it in our notes now. One of the first literary instantiations or portrayals of a dragon is Beowulf 3. Okay? This idea of this creature that is terribly frightening, who is a destroyer, okay? Well, at the beginning of Babel 3, the dragon wakes up and realizes that some fool snuck into his lair and stole some golden cup. Immediately, the dragon gets really mad, it's flying around all over the place, blitzing everybody, killing things, etc., etc., Beowulf is told about it, and Beowulf says, whoa, 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 we can't have dragons messing with my people. Remember, Beowulf is the king. Beowulf says, I'm going to go off, I'm going to fight this dragon. He'll take with him a few warriors, but Beowulf, interestingly, Beowulf will decide to fight the dragon alone. He goes out in front of the cave where the dragon lives, he calls the dragon out, the dragon comes out, and they begin to have a fight. Only one problem, Beowulf's shield is made of wood. Whoops, not a good thing if you're going to fight against a dragon who's shooting fire at you. It doesn't take long for the other warriors who have been brought along to say, yeah, this is not what I signed up for, and they all turn around and start running away. They are not interested in fighting dragons, you see. There is one of them, however. His name is Wiglaf, and Wiglaf will say to the other guys as they're running away, whoa, whoa, whoa. A few days ago, we promised our king, Beowulf, that we would stand by his side and fight. And he promised that he would give us treasure and, you know, uh, rings and stuff like that, pr you know, precious jewelry as payment. What are we doing? We can't run away. The other guys are like, dude, did you see that dragon? We're not interested in that today. Uh, and they all leave. Only Wiglaf 
will return. Now, this is an interesting moment in the poem Beowulf. By this point, Beowulf has been bit in the throat by the dragon, and he's about to die. Yeah, this great warrior is going to lose to this dragon monster when Wiglaf shows up. Wiglaf will say to Beowulf, I'll hand you everything. I take care of everything. I'll help you out. And with the help of the young man, the old hero is able to defeat the dragon. Got me? Notice how this is a, I'll use an academic term here, recapitulation or a repeating of an earlier theme. Old man Rothgar, and when he was young, Rothgar could defeat everyone. When he got old, Grindel shows up. Who saves Rothgar? Young man Beowulf. Now Beowulf has become like Rothgar old, right? And now Wiglaf has to show up to save Beowulf. They kill the dragon, but in the process, are you ready for this? Um, Beowulf is going to die. Now I say that because sometimes we have this idea that these old texts are like the simple texts. And that we live in the modern age, and so we have these really modern texts. But can you imagine that at the end of any Jackie Chan film, right? When he's fighting against all the bad guys or whatever, right? And the, the lead bad guy, who we've been waiting for him to kick the ever-living snot out of, right? Finally just pulls out a huge gun and goes, whoom, and just blows him away. And then the credits all roll, right? Can you imagine? See, so for, for a number of us, A, we would say that could never happen in a Jackie Chan film because Jackie Chan can't die. And B, um, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty lame ending. I mean, people would walk out of the theater going, geez, that sucked. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? Why? Because Jackie Chan, see, this is our, this is our simpleton view, right? Jackie Chan is supposed to st always live, and the bad guy is supposed to always die. Die. Well, let's point out the sophistication of the Anglo-Saxon story. Beowulf is a hero, but he's going to have to die. And he does die. He dies by a bite from the dragon to his throat. But, key, before he dies, he's got to talk. And it will be these speeches in Beowulf that are actually the most important. He says several interesting things to Wiglaf right before he dies. The first thing he says is, hey, young man, will you run and grab me a bunch of that treasure and bring it back. I want to look at it, which is kind of interesting. And then he says, you know, I'm kind of bummed out about the fact that I don't have a son. Beowulf never had an heir. He never had a son to pass on his kingdom to, to pass on his lineage to. We kind of get the sense that maybe Wiglaf will become that. And then Beowulf says some things very interesting, maybe even for your notes. He says, I, I kind of want to be remembered for the following things. We will call this the Anglo-Saxon warrior code. He will say, first and foremost, I didn't lie. I told the truth. He says, That's, that was an important part of my life. People knew that when I said something, I meant it. I told the truth. Second of all, he says, I tried to take care of other people. I was kind of kind and compassionate. I wasn't a mean guy, if you will. And then third and most importantly, he says, no one will ever be able to say about me that I killed my brothers. I never engaged in civil war. I killed lots of other people, but they were outside of my tribe. But I never killed anybody within my tribe. Now, we, of course, understand what Lincoln meant when he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We have an early instantiation of the idea, you cannot have fighting within the tribe. Fighting tribe to tribe, okay, but not fighting within the tribe. In other words, Beowulf says, I promoted unity or harmony. And that's what made me a great king and a great person. Then finally, and this maybe is most importantly, Beowulf says to Wiglaf, this is how I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered by you building a lighthouse, sometimes translated as a barrow, Beowulf's barrow. It is to say a lighthouse. Question, why would Beowulf request to be remembered by having them build a lighthouse. Well, of course, we live in the middle of the desert. So the first thing we got to do is to make sure we all know what a lighthouse is, okay? First of all, what is a lighthouse? A lighthouse does what? Maybe you've heard about this from movies or whatever. Or you've traveled and even seen a lighthouse. Short or tall structure? Tall. Usually tall. Where does it sit? Far inland or right next to the sea, correct? Now, why does it sit right next to the sea? What is the advantage of having a tall... That's right. Who can see the shore? Clearly not people on the shore, right? People who are where? 
in their ships on the ocean, especially in the, the origination of where this story comes from, you have terrible fog that can come in. And it's very difficult at times to navigate. And you have uh, you know, rocks that can ruin your ship and kill all your soldiers, sailors. And so the ability then to look up, to see the lighthouse, and to know how to navigate. Jot down in your notes real quickly. Why do you think Beowulf would request a lighthouse to be remembered, Bob? Jot it down in your notes real quickly before we listen to Mr. Keeley's important answer. Why do you think Beowulf would say, the way I want to be remembered is through a lighthouse? Another way I suppose, Mr. Keeley, we could ask this question and maybe you'll answer it this way is, what is allegorical or allegorically significant of the fact that Beowulf's final request is a lighthouse? Like, what, what's that all about? Go ahead, Mr. Keeley, talk to us. But then he's still remembered as a hero and he saves lives. So. Keep going. Whereas without it, you'd probably run into the rocks or something of the like, when you see the lighthouse, you'd immediately think of Beowulf and how, start thanking him for saving your life, basically. Good. Another way to ask this question, and I'll ask it this way now for your notes, to amplify what Mr. Keeley importantly just said, is this. In what ways is Beowulf's life like a lighthouse? Jot down an answer to that. In what way? To whom would Beowulf's life, do you understand my question, Mr. Rothlutner? To whom would Beowulf's life be like a lighthouse? In what way would his life serve as a lighthouse? What do you think, Frederick? How would Beowulf's life be like a lighthouse? A guide, if you will. Well, like, in the story, he killed a bunch of, like, monsters. He's brave. Yeah. Courageous. And like the the be kind of he sets the standard. Yeah. Sets the standard of my uh, what it means to be a good warrior, a good leader. Right? Beowulf's life then will become the standard of all great warriors. If you want to be a great warrior, you got to be like Beowulf. Really? What was, what was Beowulf like? Nobody asked that question. Why not? Because this story gets told from the time you're a little child. You know the story of Beowulf. You've heard it many, many times. It becomes a part of the way you think. Finally, the epic will end with the funeral pyre of Beowulf. We're told that his body is burned. This is the way that they, that they uh, would do it. And, uh, and then the people walk around the funeral pyre in mourning, <laughs> lamenting the passing of their great leader. There is some sense that maybe... There's a political vacuum coming if Wiglaf can't do the job. Beowulf is such a great leader. The great thing about having a great leader is he is a great leader. The bad thing about having a great leader is he can't live forever. So once he goes, inevitably you can have problems. A power vacuum can occur. And this leads to the important political question of the handing on of power. There are several ways for that to happen, isn't there, politically speaking. One way is the leader will have a son, sometimes a daughter, we think of Queen Elizabeth, don't we, who will then step into the throne and continue the succession. That's one way. Another way is with the passing of one leader, the people who are to be governed kind of decide through some kind of vote or whatever. There's, of course, a third way, and that's the violent way, where oftentimes as soon as a great leader dies, all of the would-be leaders fight it out, and the last one standing is the leader of the people again. We will see this topic in British thought recapitulated over and over again. Maybe the most significant next step in our storyline moves from Beowulf to a chap called King Arthur. Maybe England's greatest king in mythic lore, okay? And what makes Arthur such an important figure is he's a great unifier, just like Beowulf. He has got, he's got great courage, just like Mr. Frederick said, and he's a great unifier, but he has to die. And it'll always be that question of, okay, so who follows, right? Who follows the fall of the king? Who will be the next king? Who will be the next leader? Now, we point this out because you live in a country without a king. You live in a country that has a president who is elected to office, right? So your founding thinkers understood this difficulty of succession, 
and decided that one solution is to not wait until a chap dies, but rather to say, you have certain period of time to be our leader, and then we will have a new leader who will be appropriated through the voice of the people in voting. Now, there is huge debate about which way is best. There are still people today who will argue giving an individual a certain amount of time and saying you're our leader is an asinine way to run a country because that individual has too much power for a short period of time and or that's not enough time to be able to accomplish all that needs to be done. Right about the time, in other words, he or she figures it out, he or she has to leave office and somebody else has to come in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There will be huge debate about this in the history of thought. What's the best way to A, get a leader, B, keep that leader, and then of course C, replace that leader? What's the best way to do that? And if you'll think about it, some of your history study of high school has been kind of a study or an analysis of what's right and what's wrong with that whole project, right? And how that kind of works out. So there you go, an overview of the Beowulf epic in three parts that ends with, ironically, the death of the hero. Notice we don't have the death of Batman in the three latest Batman offerings, even in the third. We don't have, I mean, it's a mythic death, right? It's an assumed death, but not a real death. We don't have the death of Spider-Man. We don't have the death of soon the performance of Superman will come. We don't, we don't end our stories with the death of our heroes. How come? Well, because we like to imagine our heroes as somehow immortal, eternal. They don't die. The Beowulf epic is pretty sophisticated here for being such an old story. And it says, no, first you're young, and then you're not. And that's called life, which of course you already knew if you had recently picked up a picture of your ninth grade year and looked at it, or some of the stuff that your moms are throwing together for yearbook pages or whatever, and you look at a picture of yourself from your youth, and it's hard to even imagine that was you, but that was only you 15 years ago, which in the history of humanity is not a really long time ago, and notice how much you've already changed. What will you look like in 15 years? What will you look like in 150 years? And then all of a sudden, see, Beowulf comes full circle. Yeah, most people don't live 150 years. Right. That's, that's the point. Right. In other words, you only have a small amount of time to accomplish the things that you must accomplish, right? Beowulf, we could argue, accomplished quite a bit during his life. Questions, comments? All right, now what we'll do is we're going to